من بعد اذنكم طبعا ترحب فيكم كثير فمش راح ندخل في هذا المسلسل من بعد اذنكم لغه الحديث راح تكون الانجليزي فور اوبيس ريزنز الا اذا في حدا عنده اعتراض Today uh, we have a very fortunate uh, set of speakers here. Dr. David uh, Chadwick, I think he was introduced in the morning, so I will skip his introduction as well, because of the fact that uh, time is very important here. Uh, we will be uh, hearing a presentation of about 15 minutes uh, of each presenter. I would like actually to take uh, five minutes of a question for the same presenter at the same time, immediately, because otherwise it will be uh, diluted. And then we will have a group discussion afterwards. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Uh, Dr. David to actually give us his speech about the PKI, which is the public key infrastructure, whether it is a solution or it's a problem for the uh, e-government. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm assuming that people know what the technology is. And, and I won't spend a lot of time because of short time, but basically you have two keys, a private key and a public key. And when you sign things, you sign with your private key. And you actually sign a hash of the data uh, using a hashing algorithm. Now it says they're MD5 or SHA-1, but they're, they're both deprecated now, so you shouldn't use either of those. And we look at what problems MD5 has introduced uh, in the last few years. And uh, so you take the message, you sign it, and then you compare the hashes. And if you get two messages with the same hash, then you assume it's the same message. <coughs> but if in, if in fact they're different messages, you can't tell. So the, the computer system will say the message has not been tampered with, but it can be a completely different message if it has the same hash. And this is a problem with MD5. MD5 is now uh, Collision, not collision resistant, but they know how to produce collisions uh, in hashes. Okay, a word of caution. So this is, Roger Needham was a, computer, was a computer scientist from Cambridge University, a very famous professor. He actually was the author of what's known as the Needham Schroeder algorithm, which was the precursor of Kerberos. Some people have heard of Kerberos. He's a very clever gentleman. And he said, if you think cryptography is the solution to your problem, you don't know what your problem is. And that's the message I'm giving you. If you think PKI is the solution to your problem, you don't know what your problem is. Now, you can only trust the signature if two things are true. One, the sender has the private key that was used to make the signature, and you have the public key. And the main problem is usually getting the correct public key. Because if you get the wrong public key, you believe the message is from the wrong person. Okay? Because the software tells you the message is from the owner of the public key. So if I have a public key, which I'll show you in a minute, says I'm Bill Gates, when I send you a signed message, it says you have a signed message from Bill Gates. And I have bought a public key with the name Bill Gates in it. Okay? Private keys, you have to store them to stop them being attacked because if a private key is stolen, someone can sign a message as you. So, how do we get public keys? The best way to get a public key from somebody is to meet them, shake hands, and get it from them. That is the safest and securest way to get a public key because then you know you have the right public key. Otherwise, you have to go through someone you trust. And in X509, in infrastructure that is used on the internet, these trusted introducers are known as certification authorities. And the problem is that these certification authorities are not as trusted as you might think they are. So the certification authorities sign the public key, they sign the name of the person who the public key belongs to, and then they distribute that public key certificate. So if you get a public key certificate and it says, this public key belongs to Microsoft, then your software believes the key belongs to Microsoft. And if you get an update for your Windows operating system that says this code has been digitally signed by Microsoft, your computer will believe it and it will install it. The problem is, 
It's not always from Microsoft. It's not always signed by Microsoft because the private key belongs to somebody else and the public key belongs to somebody else. So how trustworthy is a CA? CA should publish their policies and their practice statements. They should put this on the web to say how they behave and how trustworthy they are. And people should go and read them to find out how trustworthy they are. The problem is, that's not workable. How many people read the license agreement when they download software? You download software, it gives you 20 pages of license agreement, tick this box, you agree with it, and that's what you do. You never look at it. So whilst these are on the internet, how many people have ever looked at a policy and practice statement for the CA? Put your hand up if you've ever looked at one. Okay, look, three, three, look, yeah, so three, three. But you're supposed to decide whether you trust the CA based on this. But none of you have read it, so how do you trust the CA? The answer is, you trust the CA because your browser manufacturers and your email suppliers tell you they are trusted. So they have built the public keys of all of these hundreds of CAs into your browser, into your email system. So whenever you get an email, it says it's trusted. So here is an email. Hi David, this is Bill Gates here. How would you like a job as a PGI security expert? Yours, Bill. Signed by William Gates. Okay? So it tells you it's signed by William Gates. Um, and it also tells you in this particular version, not all versions actually display the email address. Some don't. This one says the email address is billgates1200 at yahoo.com. Okay? So that immediately should give you warning bells because that's my email address. Okay? And, that, and I pay. I pay $15 a year to VeriSign to buy that certificate, okay? You can buy a certificate in the name of anybody you want, virtually, from the certificate. So which CA would issue that certificate? The answer is the same CA that issued certificates to two users who said that they were employees of Microsoft and they wanted Microsoft code signing certificates. So they gave them them. And now these two users can actually write any code, any virus, they can sign it, send it out to you, and your computer system will say, this is code signed by Microsoft. So they tricked the CA into issuing the certificates for them. Okay? Those have been revoked now, but that shows the system is not foolproof. Even worse, 2011, Iranian hackers hacked into Komodo's root CA, Okay, and they manufactured certificates in the name of Microsoft, Google, Skype, Yahoo, and Mozilla. Now, once they've done that, anybody who goes to Google email, Yahoo email, they're not going there, they're going to some man in the middle, which is run by the Iranian government, who then decrypts all their email, and then sends off to the real Google, picks it up, and so it's encrypted in point-to-point -point fashion. So the Iranian government now has all the emails of all the Iranian citizens who have been using it for however many years, okay, well it's actually, in this case, months, uh, have done it. So all those Iranians who thought they were sending private messages to the government couldn't intercept. Unfortunately, their messages were intercepted. Now even worse, DigiNotar, who issues certificates for the Dutch government, so the Dutch government is trusting this certification authority was also act last year and at least 531 fraudulent certificates were issued. Okay? And they were slow to react, they were blacklisted, and they went bust. So there is a trusted certification authority who proved they couldn't be trusted, they're out of business now. So the conclusion is having an improperly run certification authority with a PPI is worse than having none at all because people are lulled into a false sense of security. They think they have PKI, they think they have encryption, they think they have confidentiality, but they're being tricked because the system itself has been subverted. Now, even if your CA operations are perfect, there are still other problems to contend with. Compel certificate creation attack. Governments can compel their national CAs to issue false certificates in the name of any organization in the world, or any intermediate CA below that organization. So if you go to VeriSign, VeriSign is based in the US, that means the US government can ask VeriSign 
to issue a certificate in the name of anyone, or what rather they do, they ask VeriSign to issue them with a subordinate VeriSign certificate, which they do, and then the NSA, CIA, they can issue certificates for anyone whenever they want using this fraudulent VeriSign certificate. And they have no choice because national security. And national security trumps everything. Okay? So user browsers see genuine trusted SSL certificates from the site, and then the agency decrypts it using them in the middle. And you can even buy commercial off-the-shelf boxes that do this. So here is Packet Forensic. This is their marketing leaflet. It gives you the technical details. They actually boast that this solves the internet cafe problem. So anybody who thinks they are being secure because they go to an internet cafe and then connect through to their website and no one will know it's them, unfortunately, if that box is installed in the internet cafe, that box gives them the certificate of the website they think they're going to. That box then makes the request to the website, gets the information, just decrypts it, encrypts it again, and then ships all the information that's been downloaded backwards and forwards off to the owner of the certificate. And that is something you can just buy off the shelf. In 1999, there was Andrew Fernandez was given uh, Windows NT to work on as a developer and researcher, and unfortunately, unfortunately, Windows didn't remove all the co all the comments of the code, and he found two private keys and two public keys, and one was named NSA key, NSA being National Security Agency, and which meant that basically built into the Windows operating system was the belief that anything signed by the NSA key or anything signed by the Microsoft key will be believed as coming from Microsoft. So the NSA can then send anything to your computer's Microsoft code and you will install it as a Windows update, and then you're dead. So, the speculation was that the USA only Microsoft never uh, actually agreed to it, etc. But you, the point is, that was meant to be hidden. Back doors are relatively easy. If you get software, PKI software from an American provider, he can bury inside the software that he gives you, he can bury a private key that belongs to the state authorities. And then every message that's encrypted will also be encrypted to the public key, okay? And anything that's encrypted will, will actually be decryptable by the authorities, okay? And they also say that you can never um, decompile the software that's part of the license agreement, so you can never actually look what's in the binary that you get because it would break the licensing agreement if you do. Um, and so again, that's another way of attacking you. Now, the final thing I want to look at is government-created viruses, because this is hot news at the moment. Very little can protect you against government-created malware, because governments, basically, they have the best brains, they go to the best universities, they recruit the best people, and they've got limited resources to spend, okay? The US and Israel have accepted responsibility for Stuknet, Flame, and Dooku. And these have been in the world for five or six years, Everybody here is infected. My computer's been infected. We're all infected. We just have to accept that we are. Um, and part of it was, was Olympic Games was the Secret Service Operation Project, started by President Bush. They spread by memory sticks. So when I put my presentation in here, I get the virus. I put it on mine. So just, just, to, just the act of copying the presentation spread the virus. So we're all infected. You know, it's like AIDS. Once one person's got AIDS, when you sleep with they've got AIDS, you know, it's just, it just spreads like that. So we've all got it, we just have to accept that we've got it. Now, they download it as an MS update. So once you've got this little back door in, they actually download a whole gigabyte of information, megabytes actually, of information as a Microsoft update. Your Windows operating system says update from Microsoft and installs it. Uh, and then, you're, then you've got it. Now, this, these viruses work with, through a command and control center. So once, once you're infected, your computer, every time you talk to the internet, is talking to their command and control center. And they're spying on you, and then they tell your computer what to do, and they will download new programs to those Windows updates. So they can put on your computer whatever you want, whatever they want, whenever they want, okay? And look at what this flame does. 
Silk net was dragging around and it destroyed a thousand centrifuges. That's a, that's a little long story. So if, if Israel or America had flown aircraft over Iran and bombed a nuclear facility and destroyed a thousand centrifuges, it would have been world news, it would have been, ter it would have been terrible. But because they did it via the internet, nobody said anything. The end result is just the same as if they'd flown aircraft or drones or something over and been a bombing. But they've done it via the internet, no one said anything, have they? But the damage was severe. And you can actually bring down whole power lines. You can knock out power stations uh, if, you, if you send the right virus. Now, look what Flame can do, that we've all got. It can switch on your microphone and record this meeting. It can switch on your camera, and it's got a keyboard logger, so you can take all your passwords. Uh, it captures Skype conversations, and it sends the information back to base. Okay, so that means basically whatever you do, if if Israel really want to know one, they can they can have it. Okay. That's, that's the situation. Uh, do collect information, but they can also inject harmful code, so they can actually delete files from your computer if they want to. Uh, my laptop and yours very likely protect. There's no easy way of removing them. At the moment, there's no easy way of removing them. No one knows how to remove them at the moment. Now, these were invented five or six years ago, and they've only just been discovered. So what do you think exists today that's been developed over the last five or six years that will not be discovered for another five years? You don't know. They could be infected in the firmware, so if you try to rebuild your computer, it doesn't matter if it's in the firmware, you put the operating system on a clean version in a, in a clean room, it doesn't matter, it will just infect it again. We don't know what the uh, All cryptographic algorithms get weaker with time. Okay, as processes get more powerful, mathematicians devise new attacks. So I was talking about MD5. The problem is Microsoft codes, one of Microsoft code signing certificates is made with the MD5 hash. Therefore, flame viruses is propagated by forging an MD5 based Microsoft code signing certificate. So your computer doesn't know that it isn't the real one. Uh, and this is the problem with the weak cryptography. No one should use MD5, but the people still do. And then finally, even if you've got a PKI with no backdoors, no interest insiders, perfect procedures, latest cryptography, still not enough anyway, because you only know who the person is. PKI only tells you who the person is, and that's not good enough, because what you really want to know is what they're entitled to do. That's actually Thank you. what you want to know. Thank you, and David. For that, you need an authorization infrastructure of the matter as well. Thank you. So uh, I will start with a question myself okay. because I wanted to con uh, to actually challenge your uh, first conclusion. My take on this, obviously, yes, there are uh, weakness in MD5 collision, and that's why the reason they invented CHA1, for example. Yes, there is a weakness with the intermediate CA, and that's why you can find a man-in-the-middle attack for the SSL. And the level of trust that you can actually put in the certificate authority because nobody reads all of this 20 pages uh, description. However, those are all malpractices from practitioners, not necessarily from the science behind it or from the strength behind these protocols. Be it SHA-1, PKI, or uh, certification authority. Um, so, uh, uh, I just want to make sure that the audience here does not uh, conclude that PKI is a bad thing to do. No, it's absolutely not. PKI, at least to my knowledge and to my understanding, which I spend a significant part of my life doing uh, cryptography, um, is this the strongest available tool known in the uh, cryptography and in the, uh, uh, in the security and information security. Having said all of the above, uh, SSL, which is based on the PKI for one single side of the SSL handshake protocol, which is the authentication of the server, is yet to be broken. Uh, yes, as I said, there are some man in the middle attacks because of the uh, intermediate uh, certificate authority mal behavior, but not necessarily on the strength and crypto analysis of the protocol. So how do you, uh, the question then, um,
how do you uh, draw or strike the balance between practitioner, practitioner and lack of basically uh, doing the right things in terms of the, or on behalf of the practitioners, whether it's a CA or whoever gave you that uh, uh, certificate on behalf of Bill Gates, these uh, are the, the, um, the strength of the BQI as a tool and yet uh, continue to be as a tool for uh, uh, hardening the security of the infrastructure. Okay, so I don't know. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so security of a system is only as strong as its weakest link. So there's absolutely no point in building a 10 foot high concrete wall reinforced that's one meter wide to stop people getting into Berzak University. So yes, the cryptography is strong, but it's pointless if everything around it is weak because you don't go after the cryptography. You'll go after everything else around it. Now I showed you that the cryptography is not strong in case of MD5 because MD5 is actually broken in that respect. So eventually the wall starts to crumble anyway in terms of the tax. I mean, we're talking over a long period of time. We're talking over sort of 20 years. Uh, the, the wall starts to crumble. But you don't actually usually go for the wall. You just go around the wall. And so you can have very strong cryptography. I don't break the crypto. I give you the wrong key. That's as simple as that. I give you the wrong key, and you say, this is solid. It hasn't been attacked. Absolutely right. But it never came from this girl here, who you thought it came from. It came from the attacker over, over there who pretended to be the girl. So you've got your strong cryptography, but you're attacked just the same. Anyway, I have a bounce back argument, but I don't want to do it. So I'm good. Uh, Mr. David, to complete your mission, you have to mic. Much more? Uh, if we can use a mic, that would be better for uh, video. Uh, 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 you mentioned that the BKI is the start of the problem, not the solution. What are the alternatives you recommend for authentication process between the government and citizen and between the government and institutions itself? Okay, so I use e government services in the UK. I actually submit my tax return online. And that is quite a, a process that needs to be secure because it, it's, it's talking about all my finances, my, my income for the year, etc. It's saying how much tax I owe the government. And I even submit my payments online. Okay? I don't use PKI. Yeah. I have a very long password. It's about 15 random characters which were sent through the post by the government to my registered address. They know where I live because I get paid, okay? And they send through the post to the place that they know where I live because I'm, I'm registered with my company and the, the company have registered me, etc. And they send, and I tell them, I go online, I said, it's me. I said, this is David Chadwick. And, and they say, okay, well, wait for a week and you will get a letter through the post to your house and inside that will be a secret. The next time I go in, I type in this secret and then get authenticated. That's how the UK is doing it. doesn't need PKI. Okay, there are lots of alternative mechanisms that can be used. Banks uh, have another mechanism where you send to the users a card, and it's got random characters in a, in a box. It's a one-time password card, and the challenge gives you a column and a row, and they say, what's the letter in that column and a row? And you have to type it in, and they ask you for another column and a row. And after a month, they'll send you a new card, and everybody gets a different card. So everybody has different, it's like getting bingo cards almost, you know. And, and that's another way of it. So there are lots of alternative cheap ways of doing uh, authentication. Users do not understand PKI, okay. okay? They don't understand keys, they don't understand certificates, okay? They understand passwords, but they don't understand it. So you don't want to give users PKI. If you give them PKI, you, you hide it and bury it so deep that all they see is entering a password or something So like when you enter the password, it's HTTP or HTTPS? Yeah. HTTPS. Yeah, of course it's HTTPS. Yeah. So that's PKI. So that's, that's, but this is half the question. Hold on. Hold on. Well, that's uh, the difference. Yeah, yeah. This is half the answer yeah. about the next part, about the authentication between the government and the institution. Right. So in, in that case, you assume you have got professionals. You assume you've got security people who know what they're doing. 
and you don't need a CA. You generate your own certificates and you exchange them by hand. PKI. Yeah. No, not PKI. Sorry, not PKI. That is asymmetric cryptography. Okay. Okay. It's not using the public key infrastructure. That is using personal shared uh, keys. It's more like the PGP network okay. of trust. Fine. A second question and last one. I think I gave you the chair. So well, go ahead. Uh, Mr. David, I have two parts for my question. Usually when Short we one. think about risks or we think about problems, we think in two diverse ways. First, we think about preventive action so that to prevent the problem from happening, and then we think of solutions for the problem. Like, for example, as a preventive action, Microsoft itself uh, uh, it advises people not to turn on the automatic update of their uh, server, for example, so that not to get any fraud. Now, speaking about passwords, we already spoke about backdoors, which can actually get anything you tap on your keyboard. So that means even passwords are not good enough as a way to authenticate a person, so it's easy that they can be stolen. So we need, what set of preventive actions can we do to our servers to ensure that the authentication is done right? And if we did all the measures needed, how we can ensure after that that uh, the problem, even if it happened, we can find out that the problem happened and then fix it. Okay, so there are a couple of issues. First of all, as my talk said this morning, you have to do a risk analysis. And it may be that when you look at your service, you say, I don't care if Israel knows everything. I don't care, okay? It's not, that's not the issue I'm trying to protect against. And therefore, you don't worry about the, the certificates, etc., and the, being hacked because you say, just, just take us a given they know everything. Right, let's look at all the other, all the other attacks, uh, etc., and, and then build solutions to protect against those. In terms of the end user, they do not want PKI. I, I gave you examples of how you can do one-time passwords are immune to keyloggers. Right? If you use a one-time password and the keylogger captures your one-time password, big deal. It doesn't matter, does it? Because it's a one-time password. And, uh, and, and if they've got it, they can't do anything with it because next time it'll be a different password anyway. Um, from the server-to-server -server perspective, as I said before, you're working, you should be working with professionals who know what they're doing, so they should have more skill and ability in setting up their infrastructure to be secure. Obviously, security is very important, and that's why we would like to move to the second presentation. Uh, we're very delighted to have uh, Dr. Haider uh, Klebo with us uh, today. Uh, Dr. Klebo has a PhD and two masters in computer engineering and information assurance from Iowa State University. His main uh, focus and interest in wireless and mobile uh, security with extensive experience from the uh, private and uh, public sector. Uh, he's currently uh, works for the state of Iowa um, uh, as their information security officer, focusing on the uh, general aspects of security. So, uh, Dr. Haider, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Working? Yes. So, um, I'll just tag on one of your examples. Uh, it was like, I think fall 2005, when my professor Doug Jacobs came to my office and he goes like, we have a company in, in Des Moines, that's where I live. We have a company in Des Moines, and we need to uh, assess their, their security. And he was like, you have only $500 of budget, and you go and do the assessment. So, okay, do I have any people work with me? And he goes, yes, you have like two master students. We thought, we, we brainstormed a little bit, and then with $500, we bought 300 USB keys. Um, we, we already installed a server in our lab <coughs> with a certain uh, configuration. We went to the computer, to the to that company's place, um, to their parking lot actually at like 4 a.m. in the morning. We distributed these USB keys in the parking lot. 6, 7 a.m. in the morning, people came to the work. They found the USB keys. You know what the first thing they did when they went to their desk? They plugged it in. So it called home. Like our server in, in, in my lab, it was the, the uh, the ship that will take the call from every single computer that was plugged in with this USB key. So should have we installed a malicious program on these USB keys, I would have compromised the company without even putting a foot in it, or like even sticking any passwords. So people do stupid things. 
Um, and, and as you said, the weakest link for me, I, I've been working in, like, in, in information insurance for the past 15 years, it's the human. The password that's written on the sideline, the password that's written on the big board. Um, I just came, like, sorry for my voice, I'm losing my voice. I just came from abroad like six hours ago. Um, three days ago, I got a phone call from my friend. So I'm just piggybacking on you and, 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 and I don't have it, my topic is very general. Like when I got the email from the, uh, the organizers, they said like just talk about information insurance and talk about my experience in the government. Um, I got a phone call from a colleague of mine and he was like, the system was hacked. Um, something happened to our system, like the, the, the company that he works for. Uh, can you log in? I said like, yeah, sure. What's the password? And he goes like, 0547. And I recited the rest of his phone number. And that's an IT security professional that works for a respected company. Again, if you're a system admin, you know that you have to use secure passwords. You have to change your password every three to four weeks, six weeks, 60 days, no matter what. If you use a different computer, if Rabin used my computer and logged into his email account, he better go home and change his password because I have a keylogger working on my computer. So, um, back to my talk. Um, why are we here? Um, we're here to talk about security. Is it important to you? Like, how many system admins do we have in this room? By the raise of hands. Okay. Um, is it worth securing? Like, the data that you're trying to build all these walls around. Uh, if I have, like, a, a $5 book and I put it in, like, $300 um, safe, is it worth securing? I don't think so. Uh, what is e-government? I'm not going to talk about e-government because everybody was talking about it. But it's a public service. The government is here to serve you. At the same time, it has to give you all the services that you need. I've been in the States for eight years or nine years. Not once I stepped foot in the bank or paid any bills. Uh, and I was working on one of my projects. My partner, his name, uh, uh, Abdul Latif, we were talking about the, the project that I was working on in e-government. I said, there should be a time where the user will get all the e-government services electronically, without even leaving the couch. And he laughed, and we're gonna use like the Arabic language here. He goes like, so I'm gonna stand in a queue and ask for, uh, somebody has a throttle for 10, 10 shekels? No. You, your time is very, very valuable. You don't have to wait in queue just to uh, to pay your bill or pay your, your, um, your ticket. Again, you should care, but what needs to be done, I'll be talking about it from the experience from the state of Iowa. And what are the traits that you should be looking for when you hire an information security officer or even a, like a chief information security officer for the state or the country? Um, the challenges in e-government. Just to mention the few, security, service requirements, strategy and policy, and domain of the e-government. I'm gonna be just focusing on security, but everybody else was talking about the services that needs to be up all the time. Uh, the attack that Palestine was um, subjected to three or four months ago, it wasn't like a real attack that stole data. It was denial of service attacks, which means like you couldn't go home, I couldn't log to my email, he couldn't finish his presentation, and the government, as Amjad said, they couldn't be talking to each other. Why does it matter? Um, if your security is very low for your e-government and your system has been breached one, twice, and thrice, you get like a very bad reputation, and I will no longer trust my data being with you. Again, uh, we, we, as humans, we like to gather as many information as we want from anybody. Why should I know your name, address, phone number, date of birth, uh, social security number, bank account? If I if I only want to give you like to, to sell you something, so whenever anybody asks you for these all, all this information, say no, and challenge them. As an information security officer, if somebody asks you to give him access to a specific folder or a specific application, ask him for the business need. Why do you need this? Uh, what kind of data are you trying to access? Uh, if he's not the data steward, then you have to go and talk to his manager or just talk to your manager and say, hey, we don't know what this data, the value of this data. We don't know how to secure it. We don't know if, I, if we have to give him access to it. And you can't secure something you don't see. Um, I, I will come to it in, in, in a later slide. Coming to the academic field, I have to say this, uh, we mix these three words together and we put them in the same line, even in the same breath. Right? We say like, well, we have like vulnerability, threat, and risk. The three are very different. 
uh, vulnerability is different than threat, different than risk, and when you calculate the three of them, you come up with a sum of money that you have to, to spend on, on securing your network or your systems. Um, and I highlighted the word, like, risk has both threat and vulnerability. Uh, the way to calculate risk, risk assessment. Uh, what is the threat? What is, what is the probability of this threat to be exported? Like, okay, I have this very old system. In, in, in the state that I work with, there is a very old system called SPARS. And it's not easy to secure, but it, it, there is a business need for this uh, database to be online. And there's lots of uh, like very confidential information in it. I cannot go and unplug it and say, okay, uh, this is not secure and the uh, network will be out. You cannot do that. You have to work around it. You have to build, you have to build like your reverse proxy servers. Uh, you have to have the logs and look at the logs every single time. You have to present it to your supervisor and say, hey, this application is very insecure and we need to address uh, the problems with it. Now it's his turn to go to the upper management and get um, all the efforts to either, either rewrite the application or just get a different one. The threats that we're facing now, it's, the, the list goes on. I'm not going to talk about every single one of them, but we've been subject to all of them. If not every day, like at least every year. How to manage security in the public sector? Uh, from, from my perspective, it's like three main concepts. It's cultural, managerial, and organizational. <coughs> For some reason, addressing like how the either governments should talk to each other, uh, I don't want people to look at my data. I don't want to share data with, with a different agency. Uh, another agency will say, like, well, why should he share? What? If he's not sharing his data, then I'm not sharing my data. And I only have like 64, ag 54, 64 agencies. And, uh, there, there was um, a bill that was signed by the governor like a year and a half ago that all agencies must talk to each other. Whether I like Abdul or not, whether I like Abir or not, we're both system admins, we have to talk to each other. We have to meet. We, we belong to the same network. Uh, we belong to the same uh, wire. We belong to the same encryption. So every month, all information security officers from all these 64 agencies will meet once, and they will talk about the problems that they face in their agencies. Um, the meetings are closed, they're not open to the public, everything is set in with the secret. But if I have a problem that I cannot solve, and I know that Fabia is an expert in solving this problem, I should feel very secure telling him, hey, these are my log files, I need help. And he should do the same for me. Because if his system is compromised, since we belong to the same network, my system is compromised too. Uh, another thing, the, the, the communication between the, the Department of Transportation and uh, the IRS. Uh, why should I give you a boat license if you didn't pay your, your taxes? These two, these two applications must talk to each other before I go online and, and apply for one license. So there is a need for governments to talk to each other and trust one another. What needs to be done? Standards and policies and procedures. I cannot stress more about like these three words. Uh, I know it's very boring for IT people to go back to their desks and write standards or like make sure that the policies are followed. But you have to document it. Um, today you're in this position. Tomorrow, hopefully, you'll be like a CIO or chief information security officer, and someone else will be sitting in your seat. He needs to know what has been done. He doesn't have to open a new page and say like, oh, whatever Hydra did is wrong, and we have to start from from the beginning. Um, the standard. If I if I'm going to address it for the for Palestine, um, there is no one size fits all standard. Like, write all the standards that needs to be done, like the, uh, the document that I addressed uh, three months ago, I guess. Um, the main rules, full disk encryption for all laptops and mobile devices, no matter what. I don't care what you use for your encryption. You can go open source or you can go closed source as long as you encrypt it. If this computer was, was stolen, thieves are no longer after your hardware. It's very cheap to go online and buy a laptop. It's like $400, you can get like a very good laptop. They're after the, the information that's inside the laptop. Um, social security, I don't know, like maybe federal ID numbers, social security numbers, credit card numbers, you name it, it is there. And there will be in your team that one person that didn't finish his project and will take data from his computer to home. That's why a different thing that needs to be done, which is user education. 
um, we have almost 20, 29,000 employees. Um, it's not easy to train them all. Um, usually ISOs will go like to every single bureau meeting and they talk about information security. Uh, lately, we have uh, purchased uh, from SANS their user training. And it's a 36 minute training with questions and answers. There's like a quiz at the end of each module, like it's 23 modules. This way you make sure that each, two minutes, or two minutes, each user went through this user education, they know what, they, what needs to be done. Um, I talked about this. Plan and compliance, 5% of planning for 100% project will give you 80% of productivity. If you do not plan, your project will fail. And it's not a matter of if, it's when it's gonna fail. Annual risk assessment, if you, can, if you have the time, do it every six months. Because your, your, your entire environment changes every day. So you need to know what you need to secure and prioritize it. If this application is not, um, is not accessed by the public, okay, maybe it will be like at a later stage. Fix everything that's public facing. Continuous vulnerability management, I cannot stress it more than this. You need, like, we have a chief information security officer and he has like the, the, uh, the big box of vulnerability management and all IP connected devices within the state, they connect to this computer and it's clientless scanning. So I would know which patches have you, have you installed in your computer, which patches uh, didn't install correctly, what level of, uh, of OS you're running, et cetera, et cetera. Disaster recovery and business continuity planning. Um, not too long ago I asked a person about their business, their disaster recovery and business continuity and that person was like a CIO and the answer was So yes, we're talking a lot, but at the same time you need to have your disaster recovery plan. Uh, when, 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 when Palestine is as vulnerable as Florida, but in Florida they have hurricanes, Palestine we have Israel. So when they invade Bahamas and come to every single ministry, and then the next morning you come to your network and set up, oh yeah, they didn't touch the network, and you can just work fine on it. No, disassemble everything, because you don't know what bug they installed on your computers. Uh, testing and change control. This is very, this is very important whenever you install the patches. Second Tuesday of the month is very important, but the first Friday after the second Tuesday of the month is more important to you because that's when you're going to install the patches. If anybody of you IT admins tell, tells me that you installed patches right at the minute when Microsoft releases them, there's a problem in your network. You have to test before you, before you uh, apply these patches. You don't know what's going to break. All these applications that you have running only on uh, Internet Explorer 6 and 7, they do not run on 9, then it's going to break. Then you're going to lose business. And again, these change controls, you have to talk to other agencies. You have to talk to other organizations like, hey, what happened to your system? Uh, something broke? What happened to the logs? Data application, classification, physical protection, they speak for themselves. Some controls that needs to be addressed. Uh, I know we don't have the, uh, the money to buy everything, but at the same time, we have open source. DLP is very important, data link protection, NAC. If you plug into the network, is that on the phone? But network access controller, email encryption is very important. Accountability. You, like Dr. David mentioned something about the logs. If you do not look at your logs, and if you don't have anybody else that looks at your logs, the hacker will look at your logs and will know where, when, and how you're vulnerable. And they will reach your network. Logs is very important. You should have a system, um, logging, a logging system in your environment to see like what happened when. Not if, not only if you were attacked, so they can go back and say, all right, we were attacked three years ago. When do you come out and say, hey, we were attacked three years ago, or you just like hide in your corner? You have to come public. Uh, they're, they're, like, policies, uh, policy makers should come out and say, if your system was attacked and your system holds personal identifiable information, you should go public. I should know that my social security number that resides on your computer was breached, so that I can take the countermeasures. Uh, who do you call? Usually I get Ghostbusters, but you should call the authorities. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so you should have good relationship with the police, uh, you should, and you should trust them. And there should be like some trust relationship between us, uh, like you as a system admin, and the authorities whenever you tell them that my network was, was, was breached. So that's it. Thank you.
Okay, then we'll go uh, right, right away to uh, 